please welcome Mr. Tommy Hodin, Chairman and CEO of MagRabbit. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Power of Picture discussion. We are going to meet two renowned photographers who picture change the public sentiment toward Vietnam War. It is an honor for me to be here today. My name is Tommy Hurden. I was born and raised near Da Nang, Vietnam. I moved to the U.S. for college when I was 18. When I was about 14 years old, I remember the Marine land being on Da Nang Beach. The Marines were very generous to everybody, giving candy to children, and inspiring the sense of safety and hope for the future. They were truly the statement of freedom and democracy. There are many tragic images from the war and from my hometown. But there were also some good memories and events which should not be overshadowed by the destruction of the war. Today, I live in Austin with two sons born here and my wife, Tanya. I'm lucky I am the chairman of MagRabbit Inc., a global software company founded 25 years ago in Austin. We have several offices, but two offices are dear to me, a Hue and Da Nang City. I personally so grateful for the soldier who risked their life in the Vietnam War, and also for the United States of America, which has afforded me the opportunity to make the most of my life here in Austin and this country. Ladies and gentlemen, David Hume Kennelly had been shooting in the front lines of history for 50 years. At age 25 years, he was one of the youngest winner of the Pulitzer Prize, which he won for capturing the loneliness and desolation of Vietnam War. He went on to be appointed President General for personal photographer, serving in the White House throughout President for administration. Kennedy has served as a contributing editor for Newsweek and Political, and he served as a contributing photographer for Time and Life magazine. American Photo Magazine named him one of the 100 most important people in phot photography. Now, Mr. Nick Ut, a Vietnamese American. He works as a photographer for the Associated Press more than a half century. He spent almost a decade covering the Vietnam War, beginning at the age of 16, one six. He won the 1973 Pulitzer Prize for Spot News Photography for the Terror of War. You may remember he iconic photographer, a photograph of Vietnamese children fleeing from napalm bombing during the Vietnam War. It's also my pleasure today to introduce you our moderator. Ms. Angela Evans is the Dean of the LBJ School of Public Affairs at UT Austin. She is a fellow of Jack Bickle Region Chair in Public Affairs. Mrs. Evans is also a former Deputy Director of the Congressional Research Service and is a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panelists. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we are so pleased that you're here. And what we're going to be doing today is, this is how we're setting this up. Obviously, we have two very distinguished photojournalists, and many of us who lived through the Vietnam War saw the war through their eyes and through their camera lenses. They've chosen several photographs to be shown to the audience. Uh, Siri Adams, so we will take David's photographs first. We're going to watch those and then we're going to land on a photo and we're going to talk to David, ask him some questions. And then we're going to turn to Nick and he's also chosen some photos to share with us and we will do the same thing. So let's start with David's photos. David, why don't you talk to us a little bit about why did you get into photojournalism and then why did you decide that you wanted to go to Vietnam and shoot the war? Okay. Um, I think we needed background music here. Everybody was so quiet. <laughs> <laughs> it made me nervous. Um, I got, I've been a photographer since I was a kid. I'm a native Oregonian and uh, grew up in a little town called Roseburg. And all I could remember was wanting to get out of that town. And uh, I'm always looking over the ridge to the next place. And um, my career took a path from Oregon to Los Angeles to New York to uh, Washington, D.C., working for UPI. And um, I, uh, during the course of the Vietnam War, uh, when it started, there was a, a, a brilliant photographer Larry Burroughs, uh, Arnett and some of the other people uh, knew him. I never met him, but he was an inspiration to me. He did a, a story called Yankee Papa 13 for Life magazine. It came out, came out in 1965. Um, I was a senior in high school. And the story was, uh, to this day, it's still with me. I, I, I do a lot of lectures on... Um, photography, and um, I, I particularly like to talk about this, this story about a young helicopter a crew chief in the first frame as he's got a smile, he's got a, carrying the machine guns out to the helicopter, and then during the course of this mission, uh, they let off some Vietnamese soldiers in the field, and then one of their other helicopters gets shot down, and um, uh, they go out and rescue the helicopter pilots from the other one, and the, the cover of the magazine was this guy, and he's screaming, and there's a, one of his uh, uh, colleagues is dead in the foreground. But the, the picture that really did it to me was the last frame was the same young guy bent over and crying alone in a, in a hangar. And it, it, the, the arc of the story, it was something uh, Arnett and everybody uh, were, they were talking about 
uh, stories you didn't see, and we were getting our information from Life magazine and all that, but I wanted to do that. I wanted to be able to cover a war. By the time I got to Washington, D.C., I was uh, uh, 23 years old, and I was getting, I, I had my first ride on Air Force One when I was, uh, uh, as a UPI photographer at 23, uh, I'm reminded of that because I found the flight certificate the other day. That's the kind of thing, the kind of job people uh, want to get. They go to Vietnam to, to do something like that when they get back. But that wasn't what I wanted to do. And um, uh, I felt like Mr. Roberts in, uh, uh, on a supply ship in a backwater watching the, the, the destroyers going into combat. And I wanted to be on that ship. And finally, I got the opportunity to do it. And uh, one of the other things, I mean, it was for me as a news photographer, it was my generation story. Uh, I had had four of my classmates from uh, Westland High School, uh, people I knew uh, who had, I'd photographed them for the, the annual were killed in, in combat. They were Vietnam uh, uh, Army veterans or Army uh, soldiers. And um, so I finally finagled my way into it. And um, it, it, I didn't want to be one of those kind of people who 20, 30 years later was making excuses about why I didn't go to Vietnam. But you have this passion. It sounds like you had this passion. And did, what surprised you when you got there? Were things different than what you thought you'd find when you went there? Well, well before I got there, uh, and this was, one of the worst days of my life really was, uh, uh, it, I, I think the people in my, uh, the photographers per se, per, per particularly, are always underplaying stuff and it's like uh, F8 and be there kind of mentality. Um, and uh, right before I left, I was all set to go. Uh, a helicopter carrying Larry Burroughs and Henri Hewitt and uh, um, uh, who was uh, uh, one Japanese, a uh, Japanese photographer, and, um, and Kent Potter Kent of Potter. UPI. UPI. I was on my way to replace Kent Potter, and uh, and they got killed. My one of my photo he heroes was killed, and it just scared the hell out of me. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of a sudden, this was not an abstract notion about going off to war, even though. I'd had a lot of my friends that had been over there and come back, but it, it was, uh, uh, I seriously thought that, that, that uh, maybe I didn't want to do this. <laughs> and, um, you know, I don't admit, mind admitting, I mean, uh, on numerous occasions being really terrified, but uh, I finally overcame that and got to Saigon, and, and um, uh, I had not been overseas. The only country I'd ever been to prior to that was uh, uh, the Netherlands, which is not exactly Vietnam. <laughs> it was, had its fine points, certainly. Uh, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I got there, it was so exciting for me. I, I must say, uh, it was um, the, the, just the, the energy in Saigon and, and uh, going to the Bureau, uh, the UPI Bureau, and all these people who had been there and, and uh, um, knowing I was setting off on something that uh, I, I couldn't have anticipated. And I, I do remember uh, within a week or so, I was up in i and on a convoy going down the road and there was a, a dead person on the side of the road. This is something you weren't seeing in New York City. Yeah, and um, uh, it, once again, I had this feeling of, of, of great fear. I mean, there was just a dead person by the side of the road. I didn't even take a picture, but it was astonishing. All of a sudden, it's, a, it's one of those, we're not in Kansas anymore moments. And, um, um, but I pushed on, and I, I, um, uh, I, I have a, a real dedication, not only to my profession, but to, to telling stories and, and taking pictures of things so other people can see them. I don't take my pictures. Uh, people ask me why I'm on Facebook. Uh, I'm on Facebook because I like people to see what I do. I like people to see what I see. And uh, that's been part of the drive of my career. One of the things you talked about is that as you start going, as you're starting to get integrated into the society and into the war, 
and the fear. One of the things I asked David in the back, and he said, oh, this is going to be a touchy-feely question, and I said, yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, is, you know, you see all this emotional, uh, you know, raw emotion. You see some of the worst of humanity. And how do you keep yourself whole? How do you keep your eye focused on what you, the story that you want to tell without getting really, you know, in despair, in deep despair? How do you really do this? How did you refresh well, yourself? Uh, it's a good question where uh, I think a lot of my friends, a lot of people in this room, certainly veterans, uh, and I, I will say this, this, is not, this whole idea of, of photographing wars was not really about you know, glorifying my profession so much as showing what's happening to other people. And, and uh, uh, um, I, I think the ability to do that, the fact that I was in Vietnam um, without somebody telling me to go, I wasn't drafted, I actually did do uh, service uh, uh, to a degree. I went in the National Guard to get out of going to Vietnam, and uh, I have one of those more interesting stories, I had to get out of the army to go to the war, uh, which uh, the general who signed off on it didn't feel it was gonna be creating an ugly precedent. And, uh, um, but um, when I got over there uh, and experienced a lot of situations, that were, you know, not close calls and all that, um, I I've thought about this a lot, about why have I kind of been able to put it in the rear view mirror and other people can't? Uh, and really, it's uh, lucky for me. Uh, I have a lot of friends, certainly in the military, and I think they've uh, had more of a problem with it. Um, if you're in a situation, you've got to be there for 12, 13 months as a draftee, or that's your tour in Vietnam, um, you had no choice about what was going to happen to you. And you're also the one with the gun. Uh, doing the shooting, and um, and I certainly was as, as much risk. Uh, all, any of us who covered the war were at risk. That was what we did, particularly photographers who have to be there on the front lines. Um, uh, I can't answer why. Uh, I covered the actually the, a story. The only story that ever gave me nightmares was um, Jonestown. And if you saw that, I had, I had the cover picture on Time Magazine of Jonestown and. Um, I had horrible nightmares from it, and I, I, you know, saw the dead body of Jim Jones rising to get me. I mean, I swear to God, I still, uh, I, it doesn't plague me now, but that, I remember the nightmare, and I have not had one bad dream about Vietnam. Uh, the other night I had a bad dream about uh, the North Koreans dropping the Statue of Liberty on me. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That was weird. Yeah, but uh, uh, I... <laughs> But generally, my dreams are not quite so substantial as that. But uh, so I, I, I'm lucky, but I, I haven't. Um, uh, I'm incredibly sympathetic to people who've had problems. My own colleagues and, and certainly uh, veterans, because of, uh, from my class in high school, I've had, uh, um, and, and in my career, I've just met so many people who've been in different wars, and even up to and including the, the, the recent conflicts. But I don't have a good answer for why I didn't uh, suffer from the, the, the ill effects. One of the things I always think about, there was so much controversy back home about the war. There was a lot of opposition to the war. There was support for the war. And as a photographer, did that come into your mind in terms of some of the pictures of how that may sway either side in terms of how um, that person might view the war? Well, uh, when I went to Vietnam, this may be kind of hard to figure because I <clears throat> was covering uh, anti-LBJ uh, uh, demonstrations. Uh, I remember when Hubert Humphrey came to Portland, Oregon in 66, I was just, I just started, in fact, this is literally my 50th year as a professional photographer. Nick's been with AP for 50 years, so look, figure it, he's only 10 years younger than I am. But um, uh, I, I, I didn't have a political dog in the hunt on that one. I, I, I think it's because I was brought up in a, uh, what I hope is not old fashioned way in the, in the news business where trying to be objective, we are not objective by nature. I mean, it's, uh, you see things, we all see things differently. We may be watching the same incident, uh, but I didn't have a pro-war, anti-war feeling about it. It wasn't, it, to me, it was a story. It was it directly impacted me. It was uh, um, uh, was taking the lives of people I knew. Uh, 
my, my career has been based on curiosity. I wanted to see why, what's going on over there. And by the time I got there, it was already um, you know, 1971. And uh, Eddie Adams, our friend, and the guy who took the famous picture of uh, General Luan shooting the Viet Cong, Viet Cong suspect, um, uh, and a person I admired, but he was my competitor. He was AP, I was UPI. He told me, uh, just before I left, that all the good pictures had already been taken. <laughs> <laughs> this kind of guy Eddie was, anybody that knows him, Arnett would understand that. Um, and uh, when I won the Pulitzer Prize, uh, something, by the way, that I did not know I'd been put up for, or the first I heard about it, was, it was, no, the No Anxiety Award, I hadn't even given it a second thought. Um, I got all these cables, uh, I was in Saigon, and one of them was from Eddie Adams that said, uh, I was wrong, congratulations. Oh, that was nice, yeah. <laughs> he, he went really overboard on that cable, but, um, <laughs> um, but I didn't, you know, and how my pictures affect, uh, I'm hoping that the pictures I take really create awareness of what's going on, and it's only one person's point of view. Like any photographer will tell you, uh, um, we do the best we can to try to honestly portray what's happening, then other people can make up their minds. And, and uh, like, uh, with uh, Nick's photo of uh, uh, Kim Fook running down the road, the, the, the picture could be used on both sides of the equation about, uh, look, this is what happens because of war, which is a really good point. Uh, but like whose fault is it? I mean, you know, it's all of our faults to allow that kind of thing to happen. But uh, um, I didn't look at it as a political tool as much as an informational uh, vehicle, really. Yeah. One of the things that uh, I think about sometimes is like your day, your typical day. There isn't a typical day, obviously, but you go out and you shoot a lot of different uh, pictures. Which ones do you decide to send forward and which ones do you decide to keep back? Um, and have you kept back photos that only you will see and the rest of us won't? Well, um, uh, I used to, maybe generally my day was like a week or two going into the field. Um, somebody once asked me what was the worst thing about Vietnam. I said it ruined camping for me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, seriously, my kids, <clears throat> I've never been camping with my kids, and they just still don't get why I don't want to go do that. Uh, but um, uh, I would just ship the film back. We'd try to get, uh, it wasn't like today where you can upload uh, photographs from a battlefield or wherever. Um, but um, uh, we would ship our film if we were up in Da Nang or somewhere and try to get people to hand carry the film back down to Saigon. They would pick the pictures. Actually, I had nothing to do with it, really. I mean, pretty much through my career. Now, the digital era has changed that where, uh, uh, in, in, a, in a bad way, I think, where editors are being cut out of the mix. So I always felt like for writing or taking pictures, you really need a good editor. And somebody who, a, a professional editor is somebody who is very helpful and, uh, uh, you don't always agree with their choices, but the, the idea, uh, but the pictures went to Saigon and were, uh, photos were picked there and um, transmitted out. You know, it wasn't like uh, people say, well, I remember, you know, uh, 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 the, like if TV brought the war into your living room, uh, which it did, uh, uh, Vietnam was the first time, but if, if, if television is brought to your living room, the still photo is always taking it directly to your heart. I mean, uh, 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 there's a, a great show at the museum in Washington, D.C. Um, uh, about the Vietnam War, and there are a lot of these famous pictures that Nick, uh, Nick's pictures are in there and Eddie Adams' pictures, but people will stop, and they just they are fixated by the photographs. And you don't get the same uh, thing out of moving pictures. I mean, they both have their place. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of people don't remember, but Eddie's picture of the execution, there was an NBC cameraman, I think NBC, right? Uh, yeah. Right, who was there with Eddie and has a, uh, a film of, of the guy shooting uh, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the guy in the head, and um, nobody remembers it, and it was brutal. I mean, you don't want to see it. I'm sure it's out there on... Uh, 
YouTube along with everything else. But uh, uh, the still picture, once you've seen it, is just embedded in, in your brain. And, uh, and that's why uh, Joe Rosenthal's Iwo Jima photograph, uh, I, I gave the eulogy at Joe's funeral, and I had known him since 1968, uh, to, still to me the greatest photograph ever taken. But, uh, and Nick was there at the funeral, Eddie had already died, and I said that, um, uh, uh, that Nick was the last surviving member of the God Damn Best Pictures I've Ever Seen Club, and the other two members were Joe Rosenthal and Eddie Adams. And those are pictures where uh, Iwo Jima was about a great moment in American history, uh, brave Marines uh, raising the flag over uh, Mount Suribachi on Iwo Jima, and then the exact opposite, the underbelly, the dark side of uh, war, which is uh, the Napalm Girl and uh, Saigon Execution. And, uh, but those pictures are all, they're three of the most influential pictures ever taken. And you can look at them any way you want in terms of what they meant. How did your photographs change over the time that you were in Vietnam? Did they change? How did they change? Finally? Well, the, my, I mean, there was never a day where I thought the war was a good idea. My pictures changed where uh, uh, anytime you go somewhere for the first time, it, it, particularly going from the United States into Southeast Asia, into uh, Saigon and then Vietnam all around, every day was a new day. I think my pictures were actually better the first few months I was there because uh, uh, I fell into what I call the uh, uh, familiarity uh, uh, hole. And one of the hardest things for professional photographers or anybody in general is trying to overcome familiarity of, of being in a situation day in and day out. And uh, I, I give people an exercise now, uh, taking photographs, I call it the photo fitness workout, where you go in your neighborhood and you take pictures of something you look at every day but you don't see. Mm -hmm. A professional photographer has to do that all the time. And uh, uh, granted, that wasn't like the same thing was happening all the time, but I was much more engaged with it early on. And, um, uh, but I, I, I don't think my pictures change. Uh, I really think my pictures have gotten better over the years. I've become more thoughtful about it. Uh, uh, some people would disagree with that. But um, uh, I really do think more about what I'm doing, not as an artist, but as a, uh, what's a better way to tell this story. Thank you. I think uh, we'll give Nick a chance to uh, yes, talk Nick. to us as well. So what we're going to do is look at the photographs that Nick chose for us to view today.
Nick, my understanding is that uh, one of the reasons you got into photojournalism is your brother was a photojournalist, and he was killed in the war, and you were 16 when you started this. So this war was about your people, it was, on your, it was your country. So talk to us a little bit about what you saw your role uh, in as photojournalism in terms of its role at the, in the war. You see a picture of my uh, old brother. He uh, put a picture here under 1965. Then he go back to Simon again, 19, uh, 10, I think six months later, October 13, 1965. And the Viet Cong over killed all Vietnamese rangers in the uh, counter Mekong Delta, and he killed my brother. He um, then after the one the Finland photographer come report my family, he said, your brother died. Mm -hmm. And the next two days, we had a big funeral to all Vietnam young to come to the like, beat net of my funeral, my brother. Then in uh, 1966, I applied a job for AAP when I was 16 years old. 16 and at first years I become, old. Yeah, 16 years old. Then I become come, come back photographer. I go from 66 until 1985 before the Fort Saigon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Nick, we all know about your picture of Kim Fook when you went. Can you tell us what happened that day before that picture was taken and then what happened after that yeah. picture was taken? The North Vietnamese and Viet Cong, they locked down Highway 1, but with about 25 miles west of Saigon, between Saigon and Tainin. And they fight in the most three days, June 7. Then I be there shoot June 8, like early morning, like 8 a.m. morning. I saw thousands of Vietnamese refugees in the tram and village run to Saigon. And a lot of bombs outside the Bagoda. Then I took a lot of pictures. Then I traveled with the 25th Division South Vietnamese Army about one mile. Then I, you know, you knew photographers, you in a picture. Then go, I went back to Highway 1 again. I saw one of the South Vietnamese Army, he throws the smoke grenade. As a book coming up, then he hear two airplanes coming. The first one, they dive in the rough four bomb, A-37. And the second one, like three minutes, uh, A-1 Sky Rider, they rub four bomb. I keep following the picture, I saw the bomb explosion. I don't believe the napalm. I stand there only 100 yards away huh? from from my side and with the pagodas. I don't believe everyone in the village because they're all gone. And after black smoke, I saw the people running. I saw, oh my God, two people in there. Oh. Then the grandmother carried one new baby. You see the, the baby, like one second, he died on my camera. You see the king uh, come up. And they stop a moment, please help my run child. Then I took a picture. I hold my camera, you find I look at the black smoke. I saw the girl, with her arm running. I myself don't know why she naked. Then I run inside the, the pagoda, I take a picture, keep running. Then her left arm burned so bad, her skin and the back. Then I think she died a minute. I had two cans in water, I put water her body right away. Then her ankles, they can you help all the children to help you know? Then I had my van there, the car, with my driver. I put all the children in my van. She screaming, I'm dying, I'm dying, my brother. Her brother picture on the lap. And she cannot sit like this. She sit down on the floor in the car. Them there about 35 minutes to Gucci Hospital. I keep watching her die in my car because I know she'll be dying. And uh, the time when the hospital, Gucci Hospital, nobody want to help her because they, they say, sorry, we don't have enough medicine. And so many soldiers and the, the family people under. Can you take all the children to the men hopping in Saigon, the children hopping I said, next two hours, they all die. I, I cannot do anything. I show my media path. I'm an AP photographer. Mm -hmm. if, if the kid dies, you'll be in trouble tomorrow. Then all the, ah. <laughs> the, ah. the nurse ring all the kid inside the house. Ah. I said, oh, God. That's why I went back to Saigon right away, put my all the film double up. Mm -hmm. And I developed my document with my Japanese uh, editor. We all eight wrote a film. The first picture, we, he looked at the picture, my photo. I said, why are you shot naked girl? I said, no, that's a bomb. Burn her clothes. Then we make one picture five by seven, wait for my boss, hot fast. He looked at my picture. I said, why put you still here? Can I move to New York? 
the weekend at Eurofetch in the neck if you go. Then they talk about that after the third minute later in Budapest, my picture Saigon, Tokyo, New York. And New York called Saigon, the picture Nick would pick from the whole war, everywhere in the world, the Eurofetch. Mm -hmm. So there was a possibility of censorship because it was the first time there was, they were looking at a new girl, so there was question about that. And as soon as they got over that, it was on the New York Times front page. Um, and it changed, it was a very influential picture in terms of the war. Yeah. Um, so Nick, tell us a little bit about how you, how you felt about actually taking photographs of your people. Because many of your photographs are about people and their everyday living in, in, a, in a war circumstance. Can you talk to us a little bit about that approach to the war? Um, I learned so much from my brother. He, uh, he took a lot of pictures of people die every day. Then he bring pictures, he show his wife and me. That's why I learned from him. I remember 1963 when American landing the man or the foot, not many, like, Couple thousand. That's why I want to be a photographer. Mm -hmm. When not so much, I want to say, I one day I want to be a photographer. I tell my brother. And uh, when my brother died, I said, I got to talk to AP. He said, I want to become a photographer. He said, You're too young. We don't want to hire you too young. You're only 16. Mm -hmm. But they give me a job later. Mm -hmm. I travel everywhere in Vietnam from uh, Mekong Delta, Central Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, everywhere with soldiers, army, marine over to Vietnam, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, that's why I have a picture almost every day. Mm -hmm. How did it change you as a photographer, doing, uh, photographing your own people in some of these terrible situations? You know, the picture I don't change much because I remember over 40 years ago I shot all the film, yeah. and you carry the backpack, like 40 raw film, black and white, color negative with a poor camera. and. Uh, you look like a soldier, you have a helmet, jacket, the yeah, ice suit, everything. Very heavy, I'm a short guy, too heavy for me. <laughs> <laughs> and we play every day with a soldier, like a couple of miles. Oh my God, my body's so tired. But I'm a young man, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, either you at the Army or Marine, South Vietnamese, they take care of me very well. They help me a lot for my picture. Mm -hmm. Good. That's why I make all the picture, because in Vietnam War, all American soldiers help me, and either Vietnamese soldier. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask uh, both Nick and uh, David one more question, then we're going to open it up for the audience. And the question is making the transition. After you make the transition out of Vietnam, and what did you, how did that transition help you do other things in your life? How did that, because David, you were talking <coughs> about Mr. Ford and where you were, so I'd like you to share that story with the audience. I think that's a profound story. Well, um, when I came back from Vietnam uh, in 73. I was over there a little more than two years. Um, I actually had come back after I won the Pulitzer. I'd, I'd been in Vietnam for a year and a half without coming back to the States. And I came back to the States and um, all I wanted to do was turn around and go back. I literally cut the trip short. I, I was not comfortable in the States. Uh, mm. Um, it, it's as if the war wasn't going on, and, and, uh, and I kept looking around, why weren't people more concerned about this? And um, uh, it was really uncomfortable for me, and, and the only people that had any uh, empathy for what I was going through were my friends who'd been in Vietnam, but uh, that was it. And there were other photographers, Bill Sneed, who just passed away, was one of them, and uh, Dirk Halstead, uh, uh, was a mentor of mine, and um, uh, but I, I went back, and then uh, as the war started to wind down, I, the story really was evolving in the United States with Watergate and all that, so I came back, and one thing led to another. Fast forward, uh, I became President Ford's White House photographer, and um, what happened at that point was uh, Vietnam started unraveling, uh, I was on a, sent on a, uh, I went on a trip with General Frederick Wyand, uh, dispatched by the president to see if there was anything that could be done to try to stem the tide of advancing, you know, North Vietnamese. Uh, they'd, they'd taken over Da Nang and uh, starting to move south. Uh, I, and I went around, se uh, individually, I went to uh, several places. I went over to Cambodia, Air America flew me there. You, they, uh, the place was totally surrounded. Uh, 
you couldn't get into Phnom Penh unless you had a special aircraft. And um, in fact, the guy didn't even stop. He, they, uh, I had to hop out in front of the terminal. He said he'd take me over there, but he wasn't stopping. <laughs> I was like, Jesus, you know, next time I'm going first class, you know. Uh, so, uh, 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 but I saw what was happening, and the president wanted another point of view. Uh, from someone who didn't have a dog in the hunt, uh, not the military, not, uh, and, and strangely, uh, there were two high-ranking CIA uh, uh, agents on the, or uh, uh, executives on the plane, and uh, Frank Snepp's here today, who was a, a young CIA officer in Saigon at the time, whom He's I met at the time, and um, um, after I got back, the CIA had always had it almost uh, uh, to the to the nth degree about straight scoop about what was going on. The military always had another uh, point of view, and I'm, I'm not condemning the military. It's just to, to hear it inside the White House, all those different points of view. I told the president when I got back that I thought um, my estimation uh, from my you know all my worldly experience was that Vietnam. And he wrote this in his book, by the way, so I'm not telling stories out of school. I'm always careful about that. But um, uh, he quoted me as saying, uh, Mr. President, Vietnam has only got three or four weeks left, and anyone that tells you differently is bullshitting you. <laughs> and um, uh, three and a half weeks later, it fell. And um, uh, there were other people thinking they could perhaps contain it and all that. But I. What we had talked about was I was in the room when the president made the decision to end the war in Vietnam. It was an NSC meeting in, a, in the Roosevelt Room under a portrait of Teddy Roosevelt, uh, the most, one of the most active U.S. presidents ever, charged the hill. And the, the picture that, that, uh, that I uh, it sticks with me on that was there's the director of the CIA and the deputy secretary of uh, the secretary of defense, State Kissinger, who was sitting here last night. Um, Nelson Rockefeller, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and the president, and me taking pictures, and no one was saying anything. It was right after the president made the decision to start the withdrawal, and then it went through the next uh, 40, 36 hours or so. Um, one of the stories we didn't hear from Secretary Kissinger last night, which would have been really interesting uh, for you all, uh, was um, how Kissinger went out and announced that the, the withdrawal was a success, all the Americans were out, and then went back and got a bulletin uh, that, it, that said there are 25 American Marines on the embassy rooftop <laughs> who had been brought out. Yeah. And, See, this is why I love being a photographer, because there were some really interesting photographs of that moment. And uh, ultimately, you had to go and, and, and uh, correct uh, that one. But being someone who had been in Vietnam as a, a photographer, uh, when I went back on that trip, uh, Vietnamese friends were asking me to take their kids out. Uh, it was really um, uh, emotionally uh, difficult. and. Uh, what I showed the president when I came back were the photographs that I took of uh, refugees, of uh, 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 wounded people in, in, in Phnom Penh. And uh, uh, we put, I put the photographs, uh, replaced all those cheery photos in the West Wing of uh, state dinners and all that with these bleak black and white photographs that I'd taken on the trip. The night they went up, someone took them all down. And, um, and I, the, the president heard about that and got incredibly angry and, and said, you've got to put those pictures back up. I want everybody in this building to know what's going on over there. And I think the pictures, because the subject of this is about the effect of pictures on people. When I showed him what was going on, and, and I don't think anybody's ever made a report to the president of the United States like that, uh, and a trusted person, um, uh, that he really saw what was happening with the Vietnamese people, and, and, and in part, not in, uh, in part, and people have told me this later, uh, that he was so moved by it that he continued to uh, see to it that more Vietnamese were evacuated from uh, Vietnam. And it's, when I look at what's going on today in the world with refugees and all that, and this, this uh, uh, phobia about uh, uh, refugees coming to this country, it makes me sick. Really, 
uh, because uh, the Vietnamese community The Vietnamese community has been one of the strongest elements of American society. Uh, I, I live, Nick and I have, you know, uh, Foga frequently, and uh, we both live in California. And um, uh, it is, it's vibrant. It, uh, I'm working right now on a project with a, a Vietnamese who was a PhD, worked for NASA, was uh, involved with the, the Mars rover program, on and on and on. And, uh, uh, but I'm really, happy that I had uh, some minor role to play in that. Thank you. Nick, how about you? How did you make that transition out uh, to where you are today? Uh, before the Port Saigon, I had uh, first in January, my uh, AP had a right story about refugees in Central Vietnam, Da Nang, everywhere. I applied with the American Black Tiger, Da Nang. I shot thousands of refugees on Da Nang to uh, near the Nani airport. Then I took a, picture, a lot of pictures there, I followed them. Mm -hmm. From there to Karen Bay, Dalat, everywhere. Then ferry, I'd be sent to Vietnam like uh, play coup. With the South Vietnamese general, a friend of mine, Yana Dong, he uh, told me he had to leave. I said, why? He said, Nick, this very dangerous last day. I said, this, this finished, Vietnam over. He told me. Then he killed himself after. Oh a friend of my general. Oh my. Mm -hmm. Then I fly from there, helicopter, pick up a red food. You see one picture, the little girl. Yes. I shot a helicopter. I think that thousand people died running from Pleiku to Tiwa. So many. And the helicopter carried like 30 people. They can on the helicopter. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people fought out the helicopters, you know. Mm -hmm. Nick, was your part of your family uh, left behind? I had to show my family live in Saigon, but they are old people, you know. <laughs> my uh, father, my passed away a long time ago, a few couple of brothers still, still alive today. Mm -hmm. Then I go back to Vietnam almost every year for cover story for AEP. I travel to some of former U.S. Marines for a landmine, MI story. I travel to Tainan, uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail. In Hanoi, in your near the border, China and Vietnam, I make all the land my story mm -hmm. and look for the MA. Mm -hmm. So you keep continuing to Continue, go, back, yeah. go back home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been a pretty special afternoon for me. I hope it's been for you. We'd like to take some questions. Um, thank you. Thank you. That picture there, the picture with you, is that Kim Fook there? Yes. Yeah. You, you all mentioned the several iconic pictures and how they were interpreted uh, when, when used. Eddie Adams is a particular instance where I think he regretted to a great extent in the way that, that, that picture influenced the out, outcomes, uh, particularly the reputation of General Loan. Uh, do you have any comment or opinions on, yeah, on, on how your pictures ended up? Because unlike the, the written journalist we just talked to, you had no control over how people looked at your, at your pictures. Go ahead, David. So what is the exact question? Sorry, the... They're going to hear well. Yeah. Hmm. How, uh, unlike the, written, the journalists in print, you had little control about how people viewed and used your pictures. Do you have any... Uh, feelings about, for example, in the picture of, of the napalm girl, you had people confessing to be responsible for that, that, that happening when they were nowhere near what happened, nowhere near the event. Uh, but I think that's the beauty of photography is like everybody can make up their own mind about it. I mean, we're, we take the pictures and put them out, like with Nick and uh, he and I have talked about this at some length, was uh, um, he took the photograph because it was happening. It wasn't to make a point or a political uh, point. And uh, uh, that picture has been controversial, certainly, but um, uh, I, I think we appreciate that our pictures can agitate, uh, can make people uh, get emotional about it and uh, uh, say whatever they want. I hadn't intended to cast any aspersions on your work. Oh, no, no, I did, I, I, no, we didn't get that. No, it was a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you very much uh, for coming here today. 
Um, I'm a PhD student in journalism here at UT, working on a dissertation um, actually on photojournalism. And my question for both of you is kind of tied in to what I'm intrigued with is the comparison between being the reporter with the camera and the artist with the camera. How much are you conscious of the composition? And here you are in a war circumstance and it's happening all around you and yet you go to raise that camera in front of you. What are you trying to see? What are you trying to isolate if that's something that comes into your mind when you do that? That's why God created cropping. Um, <laughs> I think both Nick and I were uh, like, we're just happy to get something in there, you know, that we could deal with later. Uh, uh, but, but composition, uh, for me, I mean, it's really important if you could do it, you know. Uh, it's the rare case where a, a picture is framed perfectly, like uh, the girl running down the road or anything. Um, uh, was that what you were talking about, about uh, how you see it, like artistically? Or? Mm -hmm. Artistic is not a word that goes through my mind at that moment, usually. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, again, it goes back to what I said earlier. Nick, Nick and I are both professional uh, photographers. Uh, uh, we're both actually, are, uh, I spent five years as a wire photographer. Really, our job is to, to show you something that uh, we saw. You know, that, it's that simple. I mean, uh, um, um, don't you think? Picture showing a story, you know. Every now and then. Everything, yeah. Every now and then. Mm -hmm. Sometimes not always the right story, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you very much for coming today. I really appreciate it. It's quite fascinating, very interesting. My question was, when you were in country, were there any areas that you were specifically forbidden to go to or simply explicitly told that you should not? Or were there any subjects or areas that you felt were off limits that perhaps that wouldn't be beneficial for your camera? Good question. Well, the, uh, and I know we're talking about like the cover-ups on the government side and all that. My experience was I found the military incredibly helpful to go wherever I wanted to go, uh, hitch a ride on a chopper. If you were stupid enough or you know excited enough to try to get into action, you could get there. And if, if there were uh, <clears throat> Americans or Vietnamese soldiers, I never had one instance where I wasn't able to go where I wanted to go, see what I wanted to see. And wh one of the uh, uh, profound experiences that I had was when I'd show up in the field with a group of American GIs, uh, that first, when they got over the shock of seeing somebody that didn't have to be there showing up, um, and uh, questioning our uh, intelligence, I'm sure, they were happy to know that there was someone there telling their story to show the world what was going on to them. And I, I had almost 100% really good uh, cooperation from uh, the government. Now, that didn't extend to what reporters were, the, uh, the briefings that were going on in Washington and all that, but by the time I got over there, um, and it was the last time, by the way, this has not happened since, uh, where we just had a free hand to go where we wanted to go. But there was never, if you had the uh, wherewithal to get into somewhere, and usually the photographers would always be going to where the action was, uh, you could do it. And uh, I, uh, did you ever have an instance where people kept you out somewhere? No, it was so easy. They helped me a lot. I, we had a mili military in a media path uh, called Mav V. I'm Saigon, if I want to go to Central Vietnam, Da Nang, Way, or play cool, I, you know, when touching you, you take a C 130 or C 123, you apply right away. We don't have any trouble. And either when I catch sun, 
or a Marine in the Army, they all welcome me to take a picture. I don't have trouble. No, the, the they, big problem is when you we, got there. Yeah, we that got was there. the problem. We didn't have a problem at all. <laughs> Getting there wasn't so the, easy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Getting there wasn't Basically. the problem. Today, more difficult. Today is. Like, why Iraq, Iraq uh, Afghanistan? I think your the election from the Vietnam War. The, I don't think they are not, media have more freedom to travel with a soldier. They call it poor camera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank we you. have time for one more question. Clarification question. I wasn't clear what happened to the young girl that oh. was burned so badly. Did she survive? Is she still alive? What's, could you tell us something about That's that? That's a picture That's of her, it. by the way. Uh, the, the photo was Nick and, her, and Kim Folk. She's still alive today. She now 54. She lived in Toronto, Canada. I talked to her one a week. One a week. She, she, we scheduled she come here this week, but uh, she's speaking in Boston yesterday. And she married, had two children, and she traveled everywhere in America to talk about her picture. And, and she's still suffering from those burns. Mm -hmm. She still has great pain from the burns. So um, I want to thank, and it's just been a privilege to be on the stage with you all, and I really want to thank you for coming. And I want to thank you as well. I have a few announcements. Okay, I just let me, you can come up afterwards perhaps and ask, because what we're going to be doing now is uh, right after this, there's going to be a ceremony of the pinning of Vietnam vets. So if there's any vets in the audience to go and mark up to Grove is going to be um, awarding them the pin. Uh, and I'd like to also recognize the Vietnam vets that are in the audience. If they're, they're here, can you please stand so we can celebrate you? So thank you all very much for coming. We really appreciate it. And there was a last question. If you want to come up, we can we can take that question. There you go. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Nick, you're the